Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Android Apps Now with Jelly Beans seminar. It's called Now with Jelly Beans, of course, because uh, the latest version of the OS is called Jelly Bean. When I talked about Android last year, did this basically same seminar, uh, I was presenting the design patterns and sort of stylistic choices for gingerbread, even though Ice Cream Sandwich had come out at the time. And this is something we'll talk about going forward a little bit. Android, of course, has some issues with fragmentation. So the latest Google operating system is usually um, not really going to become common among the users for potentially up to a year, unfortunately. But um, disregarding that, we'll talk about plenty of reasons why Android is much better than iOS. Um, OK, so we'll talk about Android versus iOS, some design paradigms, how you'll get set up in just one slide. And a big difference between this and last year is I just want to sort of zoom through sort of some conceptual things, working with the operating system, and then just go into a really basic example. In fact, just the uh, example that Google describes for building your first app, and we'll go through it together and um, just describe. I, I know a lot of, many, many of you have only coded in C, so Java is already going to be sort of a, a different perspective. And uh, this way, you'll just sort of get your feet wet and feel a little more comfortable with it, hopefully. So quick uh, summary, Android versus iOS. In Android, there's just one time developer fee, $25, none of this $100 per year thing. Uh, there are no restrictions, which means that if I want to submit an app, I just submit it. And there's no approval process like there is for iOS. Uh, you get to develop with Java using Eclipse, which is cross-platform. So it doesn't matter if you have a Mac, Windows, or uh, some Linux machine, of course, with iOS, you have to use Xcode on a Mac. And uh, Android is used by many more people. So if you want your app to have some sort of visibility or perhaps make a little money from advertisements, you're probably more likely to benefit from Android. And one thing that's always been known about Android is the extreme amount of customization, whereas iOS is very fixed in their ways so that they can maintain security and control over every little aspect of the design within their OS and the individual apps. Android is very freeform, and there's so many more possibilities. OK, so some design paradigms. Notice here, just like, um, just like iOS has tablets and iPhones and iPod Touches, uh, those are, they have to support, say, like a dozen devices if you want to support historical things as well. With Android, you have to support hundreds of devices. So there are some things that Google has been trying to implement to make um, the user experience a little more consistent, but we'll also talk about how this means that there are issues of fragmentation that you constantly have to be aware of supporting. So fragmentation means that there are many different operating systems, many different phones with different hardware running Android all at the same time. So this graph here goes back uh, for about uh, six, six months, yeah-ish, six months. And you can see how the very, very, the darkest band on the bottom is Jelly Bean, which came out over the summer. And you can see right now it's at probably about 2% of the phones have it. Ice Cream Sandwich came out um, over a year ago, and a quarter of the phones have it. So there are still a lot of phones that are using the OS version from years ago. One thing that Google has tried to do to make the user experience um, a lot more consistent across apps is starting with Honeycomb, which is the tablet version, then Ice Cream Sandwich and Jelly Bean. They're really trying to emphasize use of this action bar, which is uh, what you can see at the top here. Everything right here, including this little settings button. It's a design choice. Now, whenever you see the three dots, it means click on this, and there will be a drop-down menu, which is some sort of settings. Um, so this only shows up because I clicked on it, clicked on this button. Uh, so this is something that they're trying to use to make apps a little more consistent across the board. And so the user has um, a better sense of con uniform uh, experience. OK, so in case you haven't done this already, or if you're watching at home, then you can follow these steps uh, to set up your user, um, <laughs> your coding environment. Uh, it'll involve going to the website here. You could just Google installing Android SDK and uh, follow some descriptions there. They tell you everything. They have you install the SDK, download Eclipse's uh, Eclipse Classic version, even though, of course, 
of course, we're coding in Java. They just recommend this one. And then this ADT, the Android Development Tools, is a plugin that you install into Eclipse, which allows you to uh, have a much more streamlined experience with Android within Eclipse. It'll give you some like graphical user interfaces for designing the views, and um, it'll just give you much more support and the ability to launch with the emula emulator and all that sort of things. OK, application framework. So I just want to talk about how the projects within Android are structured. Um, and then we'll go into a quick example. And hopefully, you can just ask questions at any point and feel comfortable by the end of it. So wait, some jargon first. An activity is like the screen you see when you launch an app. Um, the entire experience is the activity itself. So you could sort of think of it as like a screen or a view, but it's, um, it's actually the source code side of it. So we still call uh, the, actual, the actual interface part of it uh, a view. It's sort of like how in PSET 7 we had the controller and then the view. So the activity is more or less the controller. And the view is what we're doing in terms of XML that is associated with that activity. Fragments are something that's implemented in Ice Cream Sandwich and going forward. It's just an idea of sort of putting like, uh, taking parts of the view or the activity and dividing them into separate areas so that we can make our code more usable for these many different uh, devices that we have to support. And, uh, it's, it's just a way of trying to also factor out more code. Services are background things like playing um, music or navigation uh, directions, potentially. Uh, content providers, those are, these are APIs within the operating system that allow you to access shared data, such as contact information. And then an intent is something we'll use when we want to launch a new activity from our current activity. OK, so Hello Android. Uh, this is going to be a project that we'll talk about, well, I'll actually do for you. And then we'll do a thing where we click a button with some text and launch a new activity. Very straightforward. But I just want to go through what, goes, uh, what will go into a project like this. So when you make the new project, um, you'll see within Eclipse, there's this project called Hello Android. Then there are a whole bunch of folders here. The ones you're really concerned with are the source folder, uh, the resource folder, the res, and then to some extent the libs folder for libraries. Um, and just to, so we're on the same page with that, if you were to create a new project, you can do this right here. So if I want to call it hello Android, um, and then it automatically does a whole bunch of the information for us. The package name is some supposed to be unique identifier that would normally be associated with a website if you had one. So for example, I will call this net.cs50.helloandroid. Um, and I already have made this project once. So OK, sorry. Let's call it hello cs50. And then it'll ask things like, what sort of icon do we want to make? These are, this is all because of the uh, Android developer tools interface um, that the plugin we added to Eclipse. So we can choose things like, you know, what icon we want and then go into that depth if we want. Um, but in the end, just make the project. And everything shows up right here. So as I showed on the other screen, um, we have the source folder, and I'll talk about what this all means soon. But you can see that immediately it takes us to the Hello CS50 screen. There are some buttons over here for adding text and text field layouts. Everything's, it's, it's sort of like Xcode, but unfortunately not quite as streamlined. But Eclipse will be your friend, and ADT in particular, for doing this. Um, OK, so the source folder. Uh, is where the Java files are held, and this is actually the logic of your program. It's basically like the controllers. The resource folder, or the res, is where we'll keep screen layouts, images, sounds, text animation, and everything else, libs, obviously libraries. And the manifest is, it's the, um, 
It's the way that the Android system knows how to interact with your app. It tells it about uh, permissions and what activities will actually be run. It's all the essential information that's necessary to run your app. The source folder is, if we expand it, um, as you can see right here. And an example bit of code would just look, this is the default code, uh, if we, as we called it, main activity. Uh, by default, we get onCreate, which is a function that's called when this activity loads. So you want to call onCreate uh, saved instant state. This will just restore any bits of information um, in case the app was um, paused or like it. Um, there's, a, there's a whole activity lifecycle chart, which you can look at when you get a little more in depth in it. But the most important line of code there is just this set content view uh, function, which will load the resource file for the layout, which just, so then what onCreate here is basically doing is it's saying, when I create this activity, I just want to load this layout. And we'll talk about what that layout is in a second. So if we were to launch that here, it just looks exactly like this. And by default, um, because we have Eclipse doing this and ADT doing it for us, um, this is all just boilerplate, boilerplate co code that's uh, created for us, and we can move on and change things as we'd like. The resource folder, like I said, this is where we hold all layouts, drawables, um, in terms of any sort of images. They're called drawables. And then sound files. Menus, it's, it's a way of just a whole bunch of XML in sort of a nice sorted fashion. As you can see, there are .hdpi LDPI, MDPI, and XHDPI folders for the drawables. These are different screen densities, so high density pixel per inch, low density, medium density, extra high density. This is, again, so we can support all these different devices, and ideally you'll have uh, different images for each different resolution. Layouts are where we include all the different Layouts that will be used in different activities. They could also include layouts um, for fragments, which just means you know partial activities, basically. If you want to do something cool, like whenever you rotate the phone, you want it to have a different layout, you can just do layout-landscape as a different folder. And Android automatically has a whole bunch of these rules within the resource folder. So it'll know to look at different uh, folders based on um, the current setup of the phone, what sort of hardware you're using. Similarly, um, this values-v11 here and values-v14 and the default values folder. This is for, well, values by itself, will, this, this will be the default values across all versions of the operating system. On the other hand, v11 and v14 correspond with honeycomb and ice cream sandwich, respectively. So again, these are ways that um, within these folders are different strings and styles, so you can customize the appearance of your app or potentially even its functionality, although that'd probably be a bad idea, based on the version of the operating system. And I talked about all this here. Again, drawable, raw, layout, values. So the default, um, if we go into Hello Android or Hello CS50 right now, it'll look just like this. It'll just say, um, hello world. As you can see right here with the Android text, the text for uh, this text view, which is basically just a label, is what we would call it in iOS. It uh, has this funny notation, at string slash hello world. This is so we can, we attempt to extract all of the strings, all of the hard-coded strings in Android into a separate folder, which it happens to be in values.strings. Um, so if we look here, we can see that um, this, we have a hard-coded string saved here for hello world, and it's called hello world. And this is sort of a, a common design decision across many uh, platforms that you want to Strings are the sort of things that we want to potentially be able to change. We don't want to control F in our source code file or in our, re in our XML. Um, so we want to be able to change this whenever we get the chance. So this XML file, strings.xml, is a way of extracting hard-coded strings that would otherwise be in our layout resources or in our uh, source code. 
Oh, so the manifest is where we keep this essential information about the application. Uh, it includes the package name. That has to be a unique identifier. Unlike the uh, App Store for iOS, the names of the applications don't have to be unique, and you can, in fact, change the name of your application uh, after you submit it. So if I start out with Angry Birds and then I make an update and I don't want to release a new version, I guess I could call it Angry Birds 2 um, while I'm on the same, same uh, like re release cycle. It would just show up as an update. Uh, so on the only thing that has to be unique is this package name, which not many people will see. Well, you'd only see if you're looking at the source code or if there's some sort of error. The components include activities, so we have to declare any sort of activity we use. This is just a permission sort of thing because, um, because Android doesn't have this sort of rigorous application process for submitting apps. Instead, they just do everything based off of permissions and declaring things in the manifest. The SDK version is also important. We can set uses SDK minimum version something. Uh, obviously, you want to submit for the, you want to uh, create code and design for the newer operating systems, perhaps not the newest, maybe not Jelly Bean. Maybe you want to design primarily for Ice Cream Sandwich, although they're pretty much the same in terms of design decisions and the actual libraries and APIs. But the Rather than have people of like the original Android version, like Donut way back when, who still happen to be using that, try to download your application and then say it doesn't work on my phone, you can just set the minimum version and have it be like gingerbread or ice cream sandwich or whatever you feel comfortable submitting. <coughs> and this is an example of the manifest. We can look at the actual one in a bit. OK. So um, we'll just go forward with the demo now. Uh, this is the demo in, if you Google, Android uh, build your first app or something like that. Um, we'll go through everything that's going on in there. And w sorry, just for reference, who here knows Java to any extent? OK, yeah. So Java's new coding language for most people coming out of CS50. OK, so well, briefly to go over again what it says here. Uh, what we want to do is rather than just this hello world application that all it does is it launches and it says hello world and it says hello CS50 at the top because that's our activity name, we're going to attempt to make a text field and a button so that when we press this button, it will take the text from the text field and launch a new activity and it will say whatever that um, text said in the new activity. And this is relatively simple. It's not very interesting. You wouldn't want to release any app like this, but it demonstrate some important design things. Um, we'll have to interact with the manifest, with the layout files, with the source code, uh, and you can see how to launch one activity from another. OK. So we'll start with the layout for our first activity, which um, I know you, it's kind of small. But uh, as you can see right now, all it is is it has our logo that we created, the activity name, and it says hello world in the center. So instead, I'm first going to make this into a linear layout, a relative layout, and these are all things you could look up and are worth going over at some point in terms of the layouts. It's a lot like HTML. We said it's not really worth knowing, but there are, in terms of like programmatic sense, um, but there are so many different layouts you can control, and it's just like CSS in terms of styles. There's a lot going on just in terms of the aesthetics here. And um, yeah, it, it's, some, it's worth learning, but it's not really, um, it's the sort of thing you should look up as you go and you feel like you need something new. So I'm going to, I can sort of take advantage of some of the ADT tools here, to, at least to start off with. I'll make a text field, and I will make a button, put them right next to each other. And they all already resize appropriately. Um, so, sorry, again, coming back to the difference between linear layout and relative layout. A linear layout it gives a little more functionality in terms of uh, filling space and making sure uh, we uh, position things like horizontally or vertically. Uh, the big difference between a linear layout and a relative layout is a relative layout positions everything relative to other views. And the good thing about it is that it takes less time to draw because the operating system looks at all the code and says this goes relative to this, here, here, that. It just means it makes fewer measurements than a whole bunch of nested linear layouts. 
um, which I would have to do if I wanted things to go uh, vertically here. I already have some things going horizontally, so I would need a different linear layout to nest them uh, vertically. But if I were doing a relative layout, I could say, keep this to the left, to this to the right, and these things below. Uh, but because I want them to fill, right now I'm going to use a linear layout. And you can see it already does a lot of these things for us. Uh, all views need to have a uh, property of width and height. And this happens to have a weight of one because, and this has a weight of one so that it fills the entire space. But the width and height are most important. This ID field right here is not important within the actual layout unless we're using a relative layout and saying we can reference one view um, position it in reference to another. So if we had a relative layout, we could say like position this below this one or above this ID. But this ID will be important when we're using it in our code because we can reference these individual views um, in this way. And then you can see their tags request focus, which is something you probably saw in PSET 7. There was an autofocus tag or something along those lines for one of the fields. And one thing, of course, we can do just like in HTML, and notice one of the nice things about ADT is that it autocompletes here, maybe not as nicely as it did in Xcode, but it does nonetheless. And we could say hint and then give it some sort of string, like write a message. And if I give it a moment, also notice that I get a little error here saying that we should use a string resource for this. So if I let it do some of the hard work for me, I can select this string, do refactor Android and extract Android string. I can just give it that name, write a message. And what it did now is it replaced that hard-coded string with a reference to the string in the strings.xml file, which means now this is here. And I know that seems a little like trivial and uh, like extra work at this point, but when you have a whole bunch of things, a whole bunch of strings, that's really important, and particularly for localization, because as I mentioned earlier, Android is a very globally used phone uh, or operating system that you can simply do um, s uh, values dash like en or values um, uh, dash like sp or, or something for English or Spanish or other languages. Uh, so We'll leave, oh, and then you probably haven't had this experience yet um, since we didn't do much JavaScript in terms of web programming, but we can also do this field called onClick for the button, and this is a way of referencing within our layout that we want a certain function to be called in our source code. So I'm going to call this send message, and in order to make this work, that means in the main activity here, I will have to create a function that is public so that it can be accessed by the layout. It's void because we just don't want it to return anything. Uh, we'll call it send message. And it takes a um, it takes a view, which is a sort of context that we can anchor this anchor this method to that individual view when we're running it. And I don't know if you noticed what I, well, you wouldn't have noticed, but uh, before, at this point right here, this, um, this view is a type that has not yet been included. And of course, you all know from CS50 about not including types. The nice thing about IDEs like Eclipse is that if you forget to include a type, it'll underline it with a little red squiggly and then give you the option to import the view. A quick way of doing that is just Control-Shift-O, and it'll import every, all the files that it needs to. So now that we have this function, send message, um, which is going to uh, send message from the main activity to a new activity. We, we're going to have to use an intent to launch the new activity from this one. So we'll probably want to create a global constant or um, also particularly a public constant 
um, that will help us know how we're going to reference the string. Because when we create an intent, we are not just calling a new activity, but we can also give it a bundle of information. A bundle is actually the term that um, Android uses. And it's a way of saying, uh, just give it extra data, which can't be of like a very sophisticated data type, but we can definitely include booleans or strings or ints, that sort of thing. So um, feel free to ask about any of these qualifiers here, um, public final static. Um, public's the important one. It means that we can access this variable from other, uh, from other source code files, um, such as when we create a new activity. We can just reference the string within this file. If it's private, it means it's limited to this individual file here. But we'll call this something like extra message. So now we have made this function. If we click the button, this function will be called. But mm, we haven't done anyth anything, obviously, with the function. Uh, what we want to do now is create a new activity, the activity that will actually be launched. So in Eclipse, we can just say new Android activity, link activity. Uh, we can give it a name. Let's call it. Um, our result activity. And then uh, this hierarchical parent field is a way of specifying how the views, how the activities are related to each other. So because this one will be launched from the other activity, we should specify that it has the parent um, Hello, CS50. Dot. It has the parent uh, main activity. Oh, and I could have clicked on the next field there, which would have told us some optional fields that it was also including. Uh, but the nice thing about ADT, the again, is that if I scroll down here in the manifest, remember that all of this, uh, well, all of this really was included by default in the when we originally created the project. And now, because we use this create a new activity rather than just adding our own class file because we went through the, their GUI for doing this, uh, it already added all of this to, man to the manifest for us. Which just means that now uh, the operating system won't complain when we try to launch this activity. And it also, of course, gave it a label, and, uh, which also shows up in strings. It does a lot of things on the back end for us. Anyway, now that we have this resu result activity as well, the actual source code file in the source folder, we, and you can see, to briefly touch on this, um, this, because we told it about this hierarchical parent, it gave this um, field uh, android.r.id.home in this on options selected. Thing. What this is basically saying is there's a menu button now that in the top left corner of the screen, if I go back to the PowerPoint where we first talked about action bar, because of the hierarchical parent, now there's a little arrow back here, and this is clickable. So we should be able to, after we actually run this app, um, just go back. And it's just a way of saving us a little bit of code there. OK. Um, now, within this, well, it seems to be complaining about that for a moment. Let's comment that out. Um, now, in order to actually interact with these two activities, we have to uh, create an intent in intent which includes all of this data. So in send message now, I'm just going to cruise through some 
bits of code and explain it as I go. So an intent, as I said, is a way to launch one activity from another. So um, intent is the type. We're creating a variable my intent. And this is actually an object, which is why we have to call it new. It's uh, common Java usage there, which might take a little bit of getting used to. This means we're using the activity um, or the class main activity. And intent in that way takes what the activity it's going from and the activity it's going to, uh, which we called result activity. And that is its own class. So we include that. And then, as I mentioned before, we gave that ID to the edit text field and the text view. So in order to programmatically capture the text that exists in the edit text, um, we use this function called find view by ID, which is similar to something you'll use in uh, when trying to get fields from the DOM. Perhaps David talks about this in lecture. Um, but it's just a way of um, getting those. That, that's why we tag these things with those fields. So id dot edit text one. It's already auto-completing for me there. And then we'll also include, um, so this edit text, now that we have the field within our program, uh, that find view, all that find view by ID did was basically, you could think of it as give us a reference to that edit text. So now we want to get the string or the message within that edit text, which we can do by using the, um, you could think of edit text as sort of like a struct. Uh, we call it an object in Java with a whole bunch of different methods or fields and attributes attached to it. So when I say edit text dot, it's, um, it gives me the chance to access a function such a, or a method such as get text, which will get the current text in that, in that edit text, and then convert that explicitly to a string, and we have saved the message. Now we actually want to do something with that intent we created just moments ago. So I will put extra, as it's called, in, in, the, um, in the intent. Uh, which again, like I said before, this is just a way of creating the bundle uh, with a whole bunch of data. So uh, extra message is the way, like our tag, so we know uh, what we're saving this under. And then um, I'm including the message. And then we can actually start the activity by calling, uh, by giving it the parameter my intent. And um, this will actually launch the activity. So now. Uh, since I upgraded to Windows 8, there, there might be some errors that show up briefly, but just try to ignore them. Oh, wait. And this is the Android emulator. Hopefully, uh, the code will actually pop up in a moment. Again, ignoring all those little things. But the Android emulator, you can emulate the operating system, um, any version of the operating system from the earliest ones, Donut, um, Gingerbread. You know, this is Jelly Bean 4.1. Um, but as you can see right now, this is something we made. Uh, this has the main activity, the edit text, the button. I can type uh, something here. But what, what are we missing at this point? We made the field in the main activity that's going to send the message to the other activity. But at this point, we haven't done anything in the other activity. So it's not going to receive anything. So let's finish up that part before we move on. So this result activity, um, what we'll need to do is we'll need to, we can also reference the uh, intent within this activity. So we have to capture the intent, uh, which is really simple. Uh, it's a function included in the um, in the activity class, so we can just say and 
And this will give us, um, now my intent is an object, which is you know, a reference to the intent that led us to this activity. So main activity calls and gives extra information to result activity. Result activity now looks at the intent that led it here. And we can access the message that we created in the other one. Um, get string extra, and this will autocomplete for me. And then the, remember the way we tagged that bit of data was by giving it that extra, this field right here, this public um, string, which is the tag for the string we actually included. So if I say main activity dot extra message, it's right there. And this is just, it's sort of like the parameter name when we passed code from the controller to the template, when we'd say like title arrow something. It's the uh, same sort of idea there. Now, um, remember this, we also um, had this auto-created or auto-generated code for result activity, uh, which includes a text view in the middle that says hello world. Uh, we could potentially make that bigger. Let's do that first. Can make it like 40 density independent pixels. Um, let's see if that's super huge. That'll be okay. Okay. And then in order to reference this individual text view within our code, we'll need to give it an ID. And we, in order to do that, we say at plus ID, which means we assign an ID. Um, if we just said add ID, it would assume we're referencing an ID that already exists. And let's call this our result text view. And notice that in the XML, there's no need for semicolons or anything. Everything's within these tags. It's very similar to HTML in a lot of senses. Uh, it just takes a little bit getting used to, but eventually you'll feel pretty comfortable with it. So let's update the text um, for our result text view. And as we did when we were getting that edit text field in our other activity, in main activity, here we will also um, likewise um, will find the view by the ID. And our, in case I didn't mention this before, is a reference to our resources folder. And then ID is a reference to everything in the resources folder, all the IDs. And result text view. And just as before, result text view is an object, which means it has all these properties associated with it. Uh, when we, we used get text for the edit text, um, for this text field, or the text view, we can actually use set text. And then we already found the message from the intent. So I can say message. And this will actually set the message. So it'll take a moment to launch. Um, and then we can see whether or not it crashes. But um, any questions about that process right there, that sort of interaction? In, man in many ways, it's straightforward. Um, the reason I'm going through something relatively simple is, again, because you get to see the interaction between the layout, the source code, how you reference things, and um, maybe get a little exposure to how Java works there. So if I actually type something in here, like, oh, hi, and then I click the button, it launches a new activity, and that text view says, oh, hi. So that's a very simple, but hopefully um, after that example, you sort of see how this interaction works. And now that mess of files on the left side for all these project folders, hopefully you sort of know where to look now. That this is your source code area. Um, layout is really the only thing you'll deal with until you include images and the drawables or whatever. And values, that will include strings, as we mentioned. And then styles is something you can, it's sort of like CSS, like address it when you want, but until you feel comfortable with 
adding extra sort of flair to your application. There's no need to uh, worry about it too much. So just to wrap up, um, one other thing you'll definitely want to include, uh, well, assuming you want to like integrate cool features and save yourself some extra coding, would be to include third-party third libraries. Uh, here, the little Android guy with the Sherlock Holmes hat, this is an action bar Sherlock um, library, which basically means that action bar you saw earlier, which is now um, standard in ice cream sandwich and jelly bean, uh, if you want to bring that sort of user experience to users on older versions and s um, save yourself from worrying about um, how the user is going to navigate on older versions when that sort of thing isn't there, you can include this library and then you just have to reference, rather than the default Android library um, libraries for the action bar, you reference this support library. Things like score loop, it's great if you're going to include a game. It lets you um, add leaderboards and achievements to games. AdMob is a way of putting ads into your applications in case you want to make a little bit of money off of it. Of course, there are Facebook and Twitter for integrating there if you want to share things easily, et cetera. Dropbox, likewise. And analytics, in, um, Google Analytics is that uh, chart-looking one there. Uh, that will be very important if you actually want to see who's interacting with your app or how, who it is, how they interact, et cetera. Um, Google, by default, tells you a lot of statistics about who's installed your app and uh, what phones they have, what operating system versions they have. But if you want to see who's using it on a daily basis and how they use it, then you'll want to include some sort of uh, tracking system like that. Uh, when you're ready to distribute your app, um, I don't need to go into that in too much depth. Click on the link here. Um, Google Play, it used to be the Android market. Um, they rebranded everything with Google Play, so now you just submit to that. Uh, it's very straightforward. You have to include a description, um, some screenshots. It's, like I said, there's no approval process like iOS. And uh, where to go from here? So I showed you a really simple example. Hopefully, um, if it seemed terribly simple, then that's probably a good sign. Um, if, if you had all felt a little bit confused or just like unsure about exactly what I was typing, that's, that's also fine. Um, but from here, go to um, Google's guides. This is a great place to start. It'll just sort of talk you through like what they expect in terms of application design, how the users normally interact with it. It's much more freeform than iOS, I'd say, uh, which seems like table views are like, I don't know, that's their bread and butter. Just everything's a table view sliding up and down. Like um, with Android, uh, they definitely encourage people to look at it from a whole bunch of different perspectives. Um, you can, when you include the software development kit and this ADT, by default you have a whole bunch of sample projects in Android. So uh, right here, Android, Android sample projects. If I click on that, and then I can choose a version um, where the, for which the sample projects apply. There's a whole bunch of different things here. It starts off with action bar compatibility, um, accelera accelerometer play, backup and restore, Bluetooth, um, gesture Builder, Jet Boy is like a sample game they give you as is Lunar Lander. There are a whole bunch of apps, um, sample applications here, and they're all targeted at different aspects of Android's API. And um, so the idea is that look for, um, like as you make your application, you, you don't need to learn everything about Android to make an Android app. You only have to learn about the parts that you're actually going to use. So look at these sample libraries. Feel free to copy and paste the code and reapply it. It's a great thing to look at more difficult code and try to understand it, um, which is, of course, why in CS50 we often give you large amounts of source code. Um, so look at some of these if you're going to use similar libraries and um, then apply it to your own code. Of course, search for tutorials. Search for tutorials. Um, I found a lot of good ones online, uh, which you know can bring up to speed with like what fragments really are and how you can use them. Some of these new design things, like fragments, you really don't have to be worried about unless you're making a you know, pretty large in scope project. Um, they're just things that Google's trying to phase in. Stack Overflow is, of course, your friend. So uh, hopefully I sold you a bit on Android, realizing it's much more easy to approach in terms of just the coding language Java's, I'd say, much easier to understand than Objective-C. Um, Android is growing, I think, much more than iOS. And I mean, the data's there, too, aside from what I think. 
So it's definitely um, it's going to be around for a while, and they are all they're a few years behind in terms of their design cycle. So it's sort of understandable that they're still working through some of these um, consistency questions. Like the, you know, this action bar is a new thing for them still, um, sort of creating similar um, similar user experience across all their apps. So hopefully um, you can uh, go forward now and open up Eclipse and make your own Android apps. Does anyone have any questions before, before we wrap up about anything? I can tell you the answer is 42, so, yeah. Okay. Well, uh, happy coding, everyone, and good luck.